interestingly, one of the earlier speakers this morning titled his talk, Barn Raisings and Poppins. While I'm here today, I am missing a barn raising. <laughs> My husband is a timber framer and we timber framed our house in Saskatoon and we had an old fashioned barn raising to get the frame up, that was last year. And today the garage is going up and I'm not going to be there, but that's okay. It will be there when I get home, just the frame. The rest of the work still has to be done after that. And my talk today is somewhat about building community, not through timber framing, although that is a community that we belong to, but through food. Building community through our food choices and the connections that we make through food by choosing to eat foods that are produced here close to home. This story for me begins on a very cold, frigid January day in 2005. We were curled up by the fire and I made an offer to my husband that he, he could have refused, but he didn't. I proposed to him that for one year we would eat nothing or almost nothing but foods produced here in Saskatchewan. In early 2005, the local food movement had not hit the radar screen. When we told our friends we were going to do this, they thought we were nuts. The 100 mile diet, which has become so popular, was not yet out there. And so I said to my husband, how do I describe this when I'm talking to my friends? How do we paint a picture of it, the spirit of the venture? And he thought about this for a, a couple of moments and came up with a few choice words for me. Boring. <laughs> monotonous. I think he even threw in privation. Ah, but this was a good thing. Because this was a challenge to me to make sure that this project in local consumption was not boring or monotonous, or being in Saskatchewan, an endless diet of pork chops and mashed potatoes and Saskatoon berry pie. I did discover when I first met my husband that he's not even all that fond of Saskatoon berry pie. And yet he does live in Saskatoon. So we decided to start this project in spring. Spring seemed the logical time to me to start because that's when things are starting to grow and you, uh, you can get into the garden and the, the produce starts coming back into the farmer's market. When you think about the province of Saskatchewan, our, the sheer size of the province, which is quite a bit bigger than 100 miles, the sheer size of the province, the geography of the province and its location sort of at the northern end of the Great Plains. Saskatchewan encompasses almost half the cultivated farmland in Canada. Almost half the cultivation of far food growing in Canada takes place in Saskatchewan. That's an awful lot of food. Surely we wouldn't starve. But on the other hand, go to the grocery store and find, try to find a label made in Saskatchewan, product of Saskatchewan. It's almost impossible to find that in the local grocery store. Which seemed very ironic to me. This project appealed to me on a number of levels. I grew up on a farm here in Saskatchewan, but I had moved to the city quite a few years ago and I was as disconnected from the source of my food as any working gal in the city. Yet I knew, I had an inkling, that there were some very interesting things going out there in rural Saskatchewan, in the agricultural heartland things that were being grown and produced that weren't even thought of when I was a little girl. When my dad grew up on the farm, wheat was king, fields and fields of wheat. When I grew up on the farm, canola had come along, beautiful yellow fields when their canola is in bloom. But now in the last decade, Saskatchewan has become one of the world's largest suppliers of lentils. Very interesting things are taking place out there thanks to ingenuity of our farmers, 
the cre creativity of our university uh, researchers, and demands in the world market. I was also thinking about the global trade in food. It seemed kind of absurd to me that food was traveling all over the world and we were going to the grocery store and buying food from all over the world when we had such an abundance of good food produced right here at home. I was also thinking about my community, about spending my food dollars into the local economy, giving my food dollars directly into the hand of a farmer so that that dollar would help support and sustain that farmer and his and her family on their local family farm. It also built a sense of community and a connection with those, the people who produced my food so that I could ask them questions about how my food was being produced. Questions you can't ask in a grocery store. How was that animal raised? What petrochemicals were used on your farm? How, how, do you, how do you live on your farm? What else are you planning to do? What else can I get from you? I found this a wonderful sense of empowerment for me as a consumer who's shopping for food. We ask these questions when we go to buy a car. We ask these questions when we go to buy a washing machine. We need to ask more questions when we go to buy our food. But I think this project appealed to me on the primary level of taste. Fresh, local food, picked when it's at the peak of ripeness, not stored for a long time, not over-processed, um, just tastes better. It just tastes better and it's better for us. And I'll tell you a little story. A few years before this, my husband and I went to visit some friends who had just moved from the city to a little farm. This farm had a big old farmhouse, a little red barn, a worn corral. It was on the top of a hill, looking down a slope to the lake. The hill was covered in crocuses. It was spring. And my friend announced after dinner that he was going to raise some pigs. He and his kids, who were still quite young, were going to raise pigs for the family. This took me back to my childhood, because when I was little, my dad raised pigs for our family. And I loved those pigs. And I loved pork chops and bacon, and I knew from a very early age where those pork chops and bacon came from. I was a farm girl. So I said to my friend after dinner, if you're going to raise some pigs, raise one for us. That pig arrived, cut and wrapped in brown paper and a couple cardboard boxes on a very frosty November day. And we thawed out some pork chops, and we had them for dinner that night. And my husband and I looked at each other in amazement. Those pork chops were so good. Those pork chops were better than the pork chops that we were buying from the grocery store. Why? Why are these pork chops so good? Well, think of it. These were a breed of pigs meant to be tasty. They were raised in a little red barn and in the mud and the sunshine, eating kitchen scraps, playing with kids. They had a pig's life. And as a result, those pigs just tasted better. And from that moment on, my husband and I decided, why don't we buy all our meat this way? If we're going to eat meat, we might as well eat the best meat that we can get. Why not buy it from small local farmers who are raising their animals with sunshine and sustainable practices? We got a little chest freezer, which is a requirement, I think, if you're going to get that much meat at once. You often have to buy when the farmer is slaughtering. So you have to buy a half a cow or a pig or, you know, it all comes at once and you need a place to keep it. I decided to, my first step in this year of eating locally was to make a list of all the things that we already had. And there was actually quite a few foods that in the course of those years we've been buying locally. We were become regulars at the farmer's market. And then I made a list of the foods that we were going to need. This list was actually quite a bit longer. And I started researching the items on this list one by one. And I tell you, it was not easy. In early 2005, there were no directories. There were very few websites. Very few farmers were trying to direct sell to the public through a website. I did a lot of Google research, but I was looking for producer groups like the fruit growers and the potato growers. 
I was looking um, uh, for um, any mention of, of a food uh, commodity that I was looking for, and then I was making phone calls and trying to investigate it and, and source it where I could, and buying in bulk and driving around and going to farms. And um, I could give you a few examples because that would best illustrate kind of the, the journey for me. Did you know here in Saskatchewan, we have the largest freshwater fish farm in Canada? The largest fish farm between the two oceans. It's on Lake Diefenbaker. And they raise rainbow trout. They raise a million or more fish a year. And most of those fish leave the province. Now, it's a little easier to buy them in our fish stores. And many restaurants are carrying them. But I wanted to investigate this fish farm. So I called them up. I went out. I found that the man, the farmer of this fish farm, is the son of a Newfoundland fisherman. Found himself out here on the prairies at a fish farm. Another example of tracking something down was mushrooms. If I couldn't go to the grocery store and buy mushrooms, where was I going to get mushrooms for the course of that year? In Saskatchewan, we have a very burgeoning mushroom industry, valued at least a million dollars a year. Almost all those mushrooms leave the province by airplane and end up on the dinner tables in Japan and Europe. I called up someone in LaRange, went up north, got, in, got a, a tour of the kinds of mushrooms that we grow here. We went out and we, we learned how to pick them. And I discovered something about my province that I didn't know, that we have these wonderful mushrooms that are in demand in many parts of the world. I also wanted to ensure that I was eating dairy products that had come from the milk of a Saskatchewan cow. So I called up the dairy here in Saskatoon. And I asked them, what are the dairy products that you're producing? They're the brand names and the different kinds of products. And I had to phone their headquarters, which was um, in another part of the country. And I spoke to their consumers affairs person. And uh, I wasn't getting an answer. We were, not, we were playing phone tag, and then I wasn't getting any calls at all. And finally, I just it persisted and got someone on the phone and put forward my question again. This illustrates one of the main challenges of trying to eat locally. When I pressed her to tell me what was being produced in that dairy facility, she said, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. We don't want consumers shopping that way. This is counter to the way that the large corporations are processing and selling food to us. They've consolidated in places, and then they ship it all over. So they don't want you preferring, preferring local foods. So it wasn't easy. Being a challenge as it was, I felt it needed some rules. So I made three off the beginning. I'll just go through them really, really quickly because they were my personal rules. They wouldn't really apply to any of you. The first rule is that it only applied in my own home. I wasn't going to go to somebody's house and ask them to feed me a Saskatchewan dinner. And they'd never invite me back again, would they? My second rule is that it didn't apply to beverages. My husband can't start his day without coffee, and I like a nice glass of wine. In early 2005, we didn't have a winery in Saskatchewan, although now we have two. And my third rule, which um, was a very important rule that came into place every now and then, in my third rule, I would cheat now and then. <laughs> I would cheat now and then. If I needed um, raisins for uh, bread pudding, or I needed um, black olives for Moroccan tagine. Uh, if I need lemons for a vinaigrette, I would go out and buy them without feeling the least bit of guilt. The whole reason behind this local food project for me was not to create a hardship for my husband and I, or we never would have stuck with it. The idea behind the project was to celebrate what we here, have here in Saskatchewan, not to create a sacrifice, but to celebrate. And if buying a, a food item from somewhere else in the world would make the most of my Saskatchewan ingredients. If everything else was Saskatchewan, I wouldn't feel guilty about doing that. We can't ignore the fact that we live in a global supermarket. We love those foods that we can buy in the grocery store. They enrich our lives. They make our foods better, taste better. Um, they may be part of our own cultural heritage and being the multicultural community, the worldly community that we are here in Saskatoon, no one would want to deny anybody those opportunities to enjoy the foods of the world. For me, eating locally isn't about closing the door on those foods, but opening the door wider on the foods that we have here in Saskatchewan. When the year was up, we didn't quit. It was just too much fun. 
We had made great connections with people. We were eating better than ever. And so we still do it on, a, on a, any given day. 85, 90% of what we eat in our home is a product of Saskatchewan. But I wanted to give you some ideas on where to start if you would like to do this. I wouldn't recommend anybody do what I do, or did, 100% like that. Start small. One or two items, I would say. Favorite foods, perhaps um, hamburgers in the summer, perhaps you decide that your hamburgers are going to be from locally uh, grass-fed ground beef that you buy from a farm. Or maybe hummus is something you love. Your hummus is going to be from Saskatchewan grown chickpeas. Maybe a special meal. Start with a special meal, Thanksgiving or a potluck. Shop at farmer's market and market gardens. Make them your first source for food. Then go to the grocery store and get what you haven't been able to pick up at the markets. Read labels, know your ingredients. Know that if it says a product of Canada and it's, I don't know, a can of chickpeas and it says product of Canada, those chickpeas were grown in Saskatchewan because this is where they were grown. If you have that basic knowledge, you can read labels with authority. Buy in bulk when it's fresh and in season. Put it away, get a freezer so that you can store. I learned to can, you don't have to go that far. Join a CSA, this is a community Community supported agriculture, it's a, a scheme whereby you, you pay the farmer or the gardener up front for the product and then during the growing season you get regular food boxes from them. Tell your friends, it's amazing, the connections your friends may have and what may show up on your doorstep. From my husband and I, we received a lot of wild food, wild game from friends who like to hunt. As soon as they knew that we were really interested in eating Saskatchewan foods and we were willing and very happy recipients of some of their largesse, um, we got these gifts of food. When you're out there in the countryside, break for food. If you see a farmer's market, if you're lucky enough to drive through a small Saskatchewan town on the day of the farmer's market, stop in. See what they've got. Buy something for dinner that night. And my tenth point of where to start, my tenth recommendation, is to find it in your heart to celebrate the seasons and to celebrate the foods as they come into season. To love those foods in season to bits and then forget about them for the rest of the year. <laughs> Unless, of course, you've put them away in terms of freezing them or canning them. Spring is asparagus. February is not asparagus. Fall is squash and zucchini and Brussels sprouts. Don't even think of buying them in April. Well, I shouldn't say don't even think. If you love them, buy them any time of year. I organize my kitchen so that I shop. When I, go sh when I plan a meal, I look to see what I have on hand first, rather than going out to the grocery store to see what I might bring into my kitchen. The bottom line for me is that eating locally isn't something I do because it's the right thing. It's something I do because it just feels right.